business. Whatever it is that you decided to do a long time before we got here, do that, Lord, that eye has not seen, that ear has not heard, that thing that has yet to enter into the heart of man, the exceeding, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. We yield today. We surrender today. We expect to get in a flow today that transforms everything we know about who you are. As big as we've believed you to be, we know you're bigger than that. As incredible as we've seen you be, we know that there's more. And we didn't come this morning and we're not coming together tonight just out of ritual or religious activity. We've come because we long to be in the middle of the flow that you've designed for us to be in, the dimension you've ordained for us to walk in. We give you glory and honor for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm going to jump right in. Pastor Ronnie, thank you. I love you like a brother to me, him and him and. So many uh, others from this house are just like family. Doc, I love him with all my heart. I, people don't know who I'm talking about when I say that, but that's what I call Pastor Ron Doc because I got so many friends that pretend they're doctors because they have honorary degrees. When I get around somebody that's really a brain like that, I like to honor him and call him Doc. And Miss Paulette, we love you guys. Thank you for having us here. We're so excited about this. We just came back from Michigan, as Pastor Ronnie referenced, and on, I'll tell you one quick story and then. I, I don't like missionary stories per se because I don't like for somebody to come from Africa and tell me what they can't do in America. I'm tired of every time I hear a miracle story, it's in, uh, there's a passport involved. I want somebody can heal people here. Amen. So I don't tell a lot of stories, but this past Wednesday night we were in a service and there's a lady who had been, I'd, I've known the lady for years and she's very sort of... Uh, together. She's not like myself. She's very respectful and just very uh, admirable. And she just has a way about her that's just very classy. That's how we say it in the South. She just has class and she starts freaking out in the service. And I've been going to this church for 12, 13 years. I've never seen this lady freak out. You understand what I mean when I say freak out? She's just, you know, acting like some of you act when none of your friends are around to watch you, you know. And so she starts freaking out. She comes up to the pastor. She starts telling him this story. She's freaking out. Then he starts freaking out. And there was a moment, a burst of healing came into that room. And she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. She had had both of her breasts removed. The power of God hit her. She went in the bathroom and her breasts were reforming. Right there on the spot, a creative miracle to the glory of God. I'm telling you, we're going we're gonna to get out of just seeing headaches healed. We're going to get into God forming eyeballs where there were no eyeballs and legs where there were no legs. Come on, are you believing that we're in a moment? Woo! I'm believing we're in a moment, aren't you? And one of the things that we've been very careful to teach over the years is that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So whenever you begin to testify, you actually prophesy. And when we release the word concerning what God has done, it gives space and opportunity for that prophetic dimension to avail itself on our behalf. So I'm believing even as I release that today, if you're here and you need a creative miracle in your body and you're in a situation where you need God to do something that medicine cannot do, then we're believing that God is here on behalf of you today. You, you are in a crowd with thousands of people, surely, but you have to personalize this somewhat and believe that really what's going to happen today is between you and God, not between me and you, and not between you and all these other people. God wants to bring the unseen dimension into the realm of the seen through heaven and earth connections, through portals, through conduits, where he can really get us into what he's designed for us to do. So I've spent the last few weeks ministering specifically on the idea of the dimensions. And we've said in church for years, we're going to go to another level. But level to level is not biblical terminology. 
Level to level is carnal terminology. You can go from level to level in business. You can go from level to level in athletics. You can go from level to level fiscally. But God has ordained that we do far more than go from one level to another level. He's ordained that we go from one glory to another glory. And I found out that some of the things that keep you from changing levels are not the same thing that keeps you from changing glories. And there's some stuff you may get away with if you're looking for carnal advancement that you will never get away with if you're looking for supernatural advancement. So God is fitting together a people that are going to be able to inherit the authority of the unseen dimension and begin to bring some things into the earth that heretofore have been locked in the heavenly realm. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith has got to bring the unseen into the realm of the seen so that we can become more than communicators and builders. We become demonstrators and miracle workers according to the power and authority of Almighty God. And I'm going to show you why I believe, the chief reason I believe, people are failing to transition into available dimensions. So Jeremiah 1 Beginning in chapter 1, this is a very, very cool piece of scripture. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Let's read verse 5 again. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. I'm going to take two theological concepts this morning, and I'm going to do the best that I can. I had a man accuse me one time. He said, uh, you're like a theological middleman. He said, you take deep theological concepts, and you make them very applicable to the simple-minded. I said, thank you. I don't think that's a compliment, but I'll receive it because I'm simple-minded. I see theological things in very simplistic terms. And I think one of the mistakes that we made, I spent eight years of my life in deep theological study. And one of the mistakes that were made by the people that led me into that study and then the same mistake made by myself in theological study is that we begin to embark on something intellectually that can only be perceived spiritually. And, and I thank God for the years I spent studying theology, but I have learned more about God in five seconds of his real presence than I would have learned in years of academic study trying to ascertain what are the intellectual necessary principles to discern who God is. At the end of the day, God is past finding out. At the end of the day, there are some things in God that have to be tasted experientially for you to really begin to understand the depths of who God wants to be in your life. If you come into a service like this and you only allow your mind to engage and never release your heart, you're going to miss some of the opportunities that are pregnant inside of this moment. That God wants to do something in you that you can't wrap your brain around. God wants to do something in you where you become like the people that our brother shared this morning. I don't, I don't have a theological reason why I'm giving what I'm giving to God. It's just that I love him more than 10%. Isn't that good? So unless you come as a child, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so I believe God's wanting to say some things to us this morning that are out of a theological context, but I want to do the best that I can to make them extremely applicable to us. I want to talk to you from the subject this morning, foreknowledge and foreordination. I will give myself a out right off the bat to tell you I'm not a five-point Calvinist, and I do not believe in hyper-predestination, in that people have no choice as to whether or not they come into the kingdom. I still believe in free will, yet I believe God foreordained in foreknowledge a place he intended for us to be at a specific period in time that would bring the greatest glory to his kingdom. 
Amen. Do you believe that you're not here by accident? You didn't float around and end up in this church. This is not all happenstance. This is not your spiritual lottery. You didn't roll the dice and pick the numbers and end up at Abba's house this morning. It's all been a part of the design of God's great foreordination that you be living in this moment, realizing your potential and advancing the kingdom to the best of your ability. Amen. So Jeremiah 1, 5, again, verse 5, which I believe is the chief scripture that is breaking apart the fallacy of abortion in America. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. The big argument over abortion is when does life begin? Does life begin at conception? Does life begin when the four ventricles of the heart have been formed in, in the fetus? Does life begin at the point that the cord has cut? And Jeremiah 1.5 specifically is trying to show us that life begins before a seed and an egg ever got together. Because God in foreknowledge was releasing his purpose into the earth before the idea of mom and dad ever coming together for the sake of reproduction. Before that was even a concept that before mom and dad existed and before their mom and dad existed, God was in his foreknowledge ordaining that you and I would live in a moment that could bring his kingdom the greatest glory. Here we are. I don't care who your mother and your father are. You're not here by accident. I don't care how less than idyllic your situation may have been in getting you to this moment. You are not here by chance, and you cannot run the risk of living your life accidentally hoping you step into the fullness of your purpose. You've got to get aggressive about understanding that there are things that are available to the believer that we are not currently tapping into. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, the works that you do, and the works that I did and greater works ye shall do because I'm going to the Father and anything you ask in my name shall be given unto you. We understand that there are things available that are not reality to us because I believe we have limited our understanding of how involved God was in getting us here. Think about this. When we look at the life of Jeremiah, there are four points of divine involvement in the life of Jeremiah before he was even born that would ultimately establish him in his assignment on the earth. The first thing is, before I formed you, I knew you. Before I formed you. The word formed is the word yasar in Hebrew. It means to squeeze into shape or to mold into form. This is Yahweh Almighty God telling Jeremiah... That before I molded you and squeezed you into shape, how involved was God in making you the way that you are? This, this will help you not to look in the mirror and wish you looked like somebody else. Because it's really an insult to the divine measure of God's involvement in you becoming who you are. Quit, quit, quit wishing you were somebody else. Quit limiting yourself because you don't have tools and resources that other people have. And realize that everything that God in his foreordination intended for you to accomplish in the earth is already laden with every necessary resource for you to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There are no excuses for you flailing through life and hoping that when the rapture happens you get to go up amen before I y'all sarred you squeezed you into shape I knew you I like this next word yada in Hebrew it means to know by observation and care it is as if the God of the universe were watching you and dreaming about your future before he formed you before you ever had a hand and had a foot and had a heart and had an eye, you were already a dream. Selah. You were already the dream of God. Whew. How many people are living with the confidence that they are the dream of God? We talk about having a dream. You are a dream. Before you ever had a dream, God had a dream. You were the dream, and you fulfilling your dream is really just a byproduct of him releasing his dream into the earth through you. You are not some clump of DNA. You are a seed sent from heaven. 
You are a word that has been released into the earth that God wants to do great things through. So before I squeezed you into shape and molded you into form, I knew you by observation and care as if the God of the universe were watching you and dreaming about your future. The next thing we learn is that he was sanctified. Now this messes with all kind of doctrinal things to believe that the church of God and the assemblies of God split years ago because they could not agree over when sanctification took place. Because one particular group of people believe that immediately at the point of regeneration, according to any, if, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That surely sanctification takes place at the point of regeneration. And then there were a group of people that believed sanctification was something that took place over a period of time as the believer walked into the fullness of the will and the purpose and the plan of God. And the truth of the matter is they're both right. Sanctification is something that takes place at the point of regeneration. And then sanctification is also an ongoing process where you hear and obey the word of the Lord and ultimately step into the fullness of heaven's design. The third part of the puzzle is you were sanctified at regeneration transformation. You were then sanctified as you walk with God, but you were also sanctified before you ever got saved, before you were ever born, before a sperm ever hit an egg. You were already distinct. Hallelujah. You are already intended to be different. You are already designed to not fit in. Why do so many Christians spend their life trying to win this glorified popularity contest of winning friends and influencing people and trying to come to church and get the trophy for the most distinguished person in the room instead of throwing up your hands and saying, with a crown of thorns, he became my king. I, I, I hear songs like that. I, I hear songs like that, man. And I watch people sing them. And, and, and I just want to start throwing stuff. I see people go, with a crown of thorns, he became my king forever. I'm like, Are you listening to the words? He redeemed us. He pulled us out of the muck and the mire. He brought the dimension of his love into the realm of our sin and brought us out of darkness into marvelous light. And it's a shame that the weird ones are the ones who get excited about that. If that doesn't excite you, you're weird. If the idea that the king of the universe sent his only begotten son out of eternity and into time to redeem fallen humanity and you and I somehow ended up in the plan of almighty God for our lives. Even when people are getting baptized, I'm just, these couples are getting baptized and one of those couples wasn't young. I know that's not politically correct for me to say that, but I mean, you know me by now. Let's don't have to wade through all of that. <laughs> that's not normal. That's not normal. Statistics say if they weren't saved by now, there's a good chance they'll never be saved. Both of them got baptized today together. If that doesn't excite you, friend, you are missing the whole idea of what the Christian experience should be. So, so Ken said at that moment, you know, that, that if all of heaven is rejoicing over what's going on, why are some of us rejoicing over what's going on? We've got to get into a place where we begin to be thankful that God's involvement brought us into a state of distinction. You can't tolerate normal, dead, dry religion, and it's God's fault. He formed all that in you. He dreamed all that. He's the one that sanctified you. He's the one that made you distinct. He's the one that made you not be able to tolerate what other people can tolerate. He's the one that made you want to go to church that doesn't last 45 minutes. He's the one that made you go to a church where somebody may come blow some random horns up at the front for reasons that you don't understand. But he made you crave something that is beyond the realm of normal, average, mediocre expression of who God is in the earth. Aren't you tired of going through the motions? Aren't you tired of just existing in some kind of religious vacuum? Don't you want to go see what Paul saw when he said, "Whether I know a man, whether in the body or the spirit, I know not of, but he was called up into the third heaven and saw things there that were unlocked. Don't you want to do that stuff? Don't you want to go from glory to glory and faith to faith and dimension to dimension? Or are you happy just to go eat lunch? If you, 
If you want to be real satisfied with the state of the church in America, never go look at the state of the church abroad. Because there is not one thing currently happening in the American church that is cutting edge. Not one. There's more power in Chinese three o'clock in the morning on Thursday Bible studies than there is anything you're watching on Christian television in America. Because there's a people there that don't have the mindset, you should be grateful that I got up and got dressed and came to your church. There's a people there that have a mindset. I am so honored that I get to go stand in the presence of a God that my sin should have separated me from forever. And I'm looking in America for a people who will quit coming to church with a sense of entitlement and start coming with a spirit of celebration that my God has changed me and that is a real big deal. Before I formed you, I knew you, I sanctified you, which means kadosh, it's a Hebrew word, it means to consecrate, to set apart. So you know, get this now, that you were distinguished before you ever did anything right or wrong. Because legalism likes to teach us that we're distinct because of good behavior. But Jeremiah was foreordained called to be distinct before he ever had a scorecard to declare how good he'd done in behavior. All right, now watch this. The last word, I ordained you, which is nothon, where we get the word in English, Nathan. It means to give, bestow, or grant. He's in essence saying to Jeremiah, I endued and authorized you to fulfill your pre-designed intention. Follow me now. If, if we then could translate that in light of its Hebrew instinct dimension, we would say that it could, Jeremiah 1.5 could be read, Before I squeezed you into shape and molded you into form, I observed you and took great care of you by setting you apart and making you distinct and authorizing you to fulfill your purpose in the earth. Isn't that good? Doesn't that, does that kind of stuff make you like I want to jump up and down and say that maybe I'm not a nobody? then maybe I'm not just in here twice diver divorced. No, maybe I have a plan. And maybe what the enemy tried to do to stop the plan is not as big as the plan because the plan was in place before I ever did anything right or wrong. Never in that verse did God tell Jeremiah, if you're perfect, if you never make a mistake, and if you study the Bible hard enough, then all these things will come to pass. He just simply says, I have a dimension that I've designed for you to go in, and you can fight against it or you can go with it. But if you go with it, I'll use you to change the earth. So we could then say, before I squeezed you into shape and molded you into form, I observed you and took great care of you by setting you apart and making you distinct. God seems almost excessive in communicating to Jeremiah. Almost excessive in communicating to Jeremiah, I, I believe your life is no accident. I believe we don't live on purpose because we don't have an understanding of how involved God was in getting us to where we are. You're not born in Chattanooga because this is where your papa took a job. You see how we live like that? Why do you live in I live in Chattanooga because wait, uh, my, my, my family had to move to this area because they were That's not why you live here. Don't, don't be so carnal. You don't live here because papa, y'all understand papa, don't y'all? Granddaddy, however y'all roll. Pookie, wherever you're from, I don't know what y'all call him, Big Daddy. <laughs> that you're not here because somebody migrated here because somebody needed a job. You're not here because you have a job here now. You're here because all of heaven and earth, before you ever got here, was positioning the players in your life to get you to God's pre-designed intention so that in April of 2012, you would be sitting in Abba's house instead of a crack house. That's why we shout, hallelujah. That's why we dance. 
my God, because we look at where we could have been, we look at where we should have been, and we even look at where other people are, and we have to stop and say that the fact that I'm in this room with a full belly and a right mind and a preserved marriage and kids that love God is not some accident. It's that God loved me when I did not know who he was. God seems almost excessive in communicating to Jeremiah, your life is no accident. So when trouble arises, as it most certainly would for Jeremiah, and as it does for you and I, there would be no question that our arrival at this crucial moment in time is not by chance. You didn't, you didn't, listen, you don't pass the person at the gas station because that's where you buy gas, because that's the closest one to your house, and because it's a tenth of a cent cheaper than your cheapskate. Come on now, it's a tenth of a cent. You burn more gas trying to run around and pay, y'all don't ready for that, pay cheaper prices for gas because you want to be able to tell people how much you paid for gas. And so you go wait in a line, and by the time you get done with the line, you burn more gas waiting on your turn to get your gas because we don't understand why we are where we are. You don't work at that job because that's the way, only way God knows how to get you money. Jesus let Peter take taxes out of a fish's mouth. Do you get that? Well, this is the way God intends to provide for me. Jesus let one boy's lunch feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and take up 12 baskets left over, and you fail to recognize that you are on your job because you are God's dimension of angelic evangelistic interference and in, on behalf of the lives of the people you work with. You don't sit in that cubicle because that's the way God helps you pay your bills. You sit in that cubicle because God needs a representative from another dimension that can bring his kingdom into the earth in that moment. The reason why we don't live like we're supposed to live here is because we do not know where we came from. You are an alien. You're an alien in an earth suit. You put on skin for a vapor, but that's not who you are. And until you understand where you come from, you're never going to operate as God's intended ambassador in this moment because you still think you need all these people. You don't need your boss. Your boss needs Jesus. You got to see that. You don't need your neighbors to like you. You need your neighbors not to burn forever in eternal damnation because they live beside you and you wouldn't shut up about how good Jesus is. You don't need prosperity because you need stuff. You need prosperity because people need Jesus. And that's why you're here, to fund the greatest missionary endeavor in the history of all mankind. That's why God's blessing you. He's not blessing you because he's impressed with your watch. God, God, God is not moved when other people are moved at the red light because your rims. You know what rims are for? To hold the tire on. That's deep. It's to hold the tire on. It's not for you to be able to yo-yo at a red light. Come on, man. There's people that need to get saved, and we're running around trying to get approval from people. Trying to get approval from people we're called to win. You cannot, my God, win the Joneses if you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. You're a prophetic voice into the earth designed to bring about God's nature. And when we begin to understand the dimension we're from and we begin to understand how God was supernaturally involved in the process of putting us into the position that we're in, then all of a sudden confidence comes. And all of a sudden we start to hear and all of a sudden, we start to invite people to lunch, and we sit down with them, and we say, God, I had a dream two nights ago, and in the dream, you were riding down the road in a red pickup truck as a little boy, and there was a black dog in the back, and it was, I was aware that this is something that really happened to me. I was aware that your uncle had just passed away, and you were on the way to the funeral. And people start going, um, um, now, tell me about this getting saved again. Not, not just the two diagnostic questions and not, not trying to use any kind of resource that we can use to get people to understand and make a decision. All that's fine and good, but at the end of the day, God is looking for somebody that can hear and obey, 
that can understand the dimension they were sent from and release his power and authority into the earth. Now watch what I'm about to show you. This is where it's going to get a little freaky. This revelation that you and I are not here by accident and that God has a pre-designed intention should create three primary things in the life of the believer. I'm going to show them to you. I'm going to break them down and then we'll see what God wants to do. Rest. Reliance. And resolve. Rest. So you can chill out and quit striving. I am beginning to understand more and more in my life. Ambition that has not come into the state of surrender is not holy. God wants a people who can receive and inherit because we are of a royal line, not because we are participating in a carnal dimension. I had this thought the other day. I, I was walking on the beach and I had this random thought come to me. Is the person in the U.S. Embassy in Taiwan worried about how to pay for the U.S. Embassy in Taiwan? Of course not. Because they understand that they were sent. And this is where we failed in the apostolic. We failed to teach people that the reason God connects you to an apostolic movement is because he wants you to have the confidence of knowing that you're not just here, you're sent here. And whatever resource you need was available to you before you ever even asked for it. You just have to walk in the realm of inheritance. Now, there's, 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 there's these two kids that's on TV all the time and People Magazine all the time, William and Harry. Y'all know William and Harry, right? William has like got his junk together. William married a girl that looks like, like you look like royalty. Harry is running around smoking pot, having parties, making, uh, there, there are pictures from William's wedding where Harry is like making faces at William and everybody, is, could you imagine being at the royal wedding and Harry is over here giving rabbit ears to William while he's getting his picture made and people are just freaking completely out over his behavior. But one is not more a prince than the other. Because when you begin to understand the kingdom, you begin to understand this. That God has bestowed certain things to you. And God is releasing certain things through you. And he wants to bless you not just because you're the sharpest businessman in this room. What happens to the sharpest businessman is the sharpest businessman gets credit for being sharp. But when God begins to bless somebody that may not be the sharpest businessman in the room, like they're the sharpest businessman in the room, then all of a sudden God starts getting glory for the dimension he's releasing into the hearts and lives of people. And it's not just based upon your gifts and your skills. It's based upon his favor and his love. You need to believe God can bless you. You need to believe that your long cutting business could be running eight crews and God could be bringing $2 million a year into the kingdom because of his favor and his hand being greatly upon you. Don't diminish your ability to obtain favor because you don't have the same skill set as everybody else. God does more than just bless skill sets. God blesses hearts and if he can find the right heart, he will release the kingdom dimension. Let me show you a couple of things. Rest, reliance, which actually creates rest. The reason why we're not at rest is because we're not operating in the realm of reliance that God's called us to. We, are, we don't see God rightly. That's why Jeremiah 1.5 is so important to me because it gives us the ability to see it's God that got us here. Chill out. You ain't going to starve. God got you here. He's got you. Let me, let, me, let me help you. You're good. You're okay. Heaven's not bankrupt. Heaven is not at the mercy of the housing market. Heaven's not twiddling its thumbs watching the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, and the Dow Jones. Heaven has everything heaven has ever had to meet every need you will ever have. You just need to start letting yourself believe that you deserve to receive it because you are relying on God. 
The last thing this does is it creates resolve. It creates resolve that is not ambition. It creates resolve that is not selfish motivation. And I'm not just talking about it producing in you some kind of get up and go. I'm talking about that you are able to determine that what God has spoken to you, you will have a resolute nature to see the promise of God come to pass in your life regardless of how long it takes. Abraham had resolve, listen to me, at a hundred Abraham at a hundred still believed what God had spoken to him through the mistake with Ishmael. That people, had, you, had to, you had to think on that later. That Ishmael did not cause Abraham to forfeit Isaac. Hear this. He still believed God. He didn't say, yeah, that was possible at 80, but it's not possible at 100. No, it's as possible today as it ever has been because Abraham had a resolve that God was watching over his word to perform it. Caleb had a resolve. At 85, Caleb says, I'm as strong now as I was in my youth. Give me my mountain. He was 45 when he went to the mountain with the 12 spies. He was 85 when he inherited the promised land. But he says something crazy. Those of you that have been to Israel will understand this. He said, give me my mountain. Now, Canaan's not primarily a mountain. Canaan is primarily a plain. But Caleb was not asking for milk and honey. He was asking for God to give him the high ground where he'd first seen the giants the first time. The reason he said I'm as strong now as I was in my youth is because he wanted to fight at 85 the same way he wanted to fight at 45. He wasn't asking for milk and honey. He wasn't asking for a cluster of grapes. He said, give me my mountain. Take me right back to the place where 10 of the 12 people with me diminished who we are in God by telling us that we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And I said then we are well able to take the land And I believe now we're well able to take So don't give me a rocking chair in front of Cracker Barrel Give me a weapon so I can go right back into the land That is inhabited by the giants And take it for the kingdom of God Now we, we, we can read Jeremiah 1.5 We say yeah that's good We like that Praise God Jeremiah is special But let me show you Psalm 139 13 through 18 I'll read this quickly This is kind of my closing arguments now watch David. I, ha, I, ha, I, like, I can go with David better than I can go with Jeremiah because there ain't no stories in the Bible about Jeremiah doing stupid stuff. But David, oh, dummy, 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 dummy. Don't do that. I, I can follow David because David does crazy stuff and certainly has a crazy family. I know can't none of y'all identify with that, but Watch the eerie similarity between Jeremiah 1, 5 and what David says in Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes... Watch this, it's freaky bad. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Remember what Jeremiah said? Listen, before you formed me, you observed me. What'd you say, David? Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. God was staring into your life before you were ever put together with sperm and egg. So you didn't, see some of you think you're Baptist because you grew up Baptist and some of you think you're Pentecostal because you grew up Pentecostal. No, you could have grown up any way you could have grown up. You could have been born in Nicaragua living in a ditch somewhere drinking nasty water. But you weren't. But you weren't. So that's not luck. That's not good fortune. That's providence. That sovereignty, that's God in his nature putting you in position to meet the needs of a person you very easily could have been. You may not have been an orphan, but you could have been. You may not have been sexually abused, but you could have been. So if you are where you are, don't just sit back and enjoy it. 
understand that God put you where he put you because there's something he wants to get into the earth through you. This is not about leaving you alone until you get to heaven. It's not about getting you saved, counting you, dunking you in the baptismal tank, and then being able to brag about how many of you there were. It's about you understanding that you have a pre-designed intention and a responsibility to fulfill it. Watch this now. Watch it. Let's, let's go a step further with that. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. So we always talk about the Lamb's book of life, which has recorded in it the names of the people who have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by way of being born again. Don't we all believe that? But apparently there's another book. And this other book, put that back up there again. This other book, no, back it up, there you go. In, and in your book, they all were written, what? The days. God has another book, and in the book, he has pinned the page of every day of our existence. What does that do in you? you, you you're going through a tough time? Well, listen. Turn the page. Come on, if you don't like where you are, if there's nasty stuff on yesterday's page, don't stay on yesterday's page and whine about all the nasty stuff that happened on yesterday's page. You got to have faith to turn the page. I'm not staying here. I know I had to go through it, but I'm not staying here. I had to go through a struggle in my body, but I'm not staying struggling in my body. I had to go through a struggle in my finances, but I'm not staying in a struggle for my finances. I had to struggle with my kids, but that's not the last page. There's another chapter, and the next chapter is full of joy unspeakable and full of glory. So don't grow weary in well-doing. Just keep turning pages. You don't have to make it happen. You just have to stay on the right page. Turn the page. I heard this coming in here tonight, today. Turn the page. Turn the page. Weeping endures for a night. But joy comes in the morning. So turn the page. Uh, if somebody left you, turn the page. If you had to bury somebody, turn the page. If the business endeavor didn't work out the way you planned, turn the page. If the last church you went to didn't treat you right, turn the page. You can either obsess about what you've been through or you can get a faith to rise up on the inside of you and say whatever I went through was not big enough to stop his purpose and plan in my life, so I'm going to keep turning the page. If people think I'm stuck, I'm going to keep turning the page. If people are speaking against me, I'm going to keep turning the page. If every devil in hell thinks they got Got me right where they want me. My story is not over. I'm going to keep on turning pages. Turn the page. Well, you don't know what I've been through. You only, you've been on that page long enough. I love you. God bless you. But for real. You know what I love about Caleb? How many funerals did Caleb go to? For real, how many benedictions did Caleb sit through? But he never stopped believing the promise because other people died along the way. Keep turning pages. I'm tired. Yeah, but it don't take much to just... You don't have to come up with a strategy of how to get... You just got to get to the next page. It's already written down. The, put it up there again. Watch this now. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written the days fashioned for me. It's already all written down. Just don't quit. There's a new page coming. Now watch this. Watch this. I'm going to get ready to close this. Watch this. This is so freaky bad. So we got Jeremiah who we got no record of ever doing anything inappropriate. We got David with rape. 
Why do you say it's rape? I say it's rape because if the king wants to sleep with the woman, the woman sleeps with the king. She wasn't given the option of saying no. Then murder. Murdering probably one of the most loyal men that's ever mentioned in the Bible, Uriah the Hittite. He got sons raping daughters, got Absalom getting killed, trying to take over the throne, got crazy stuff, crazy stuff going on. David had a perversion in his life that cost him, but it also cost Solomon. If you think David had a problem with women, read about Solomon. He wasn't that wise. <laughs> so we have God predestining through imperfections. And let me show you why I believe that is important. I hope I've done a serviceable job in establishing that you and I were pre-envisioned and are not here by accident. You get that? You get that? Come on, you get that? You're a seed sent from heaven. You're a word waiting to be fulfilled. You're a dimension yet to be experienced. Your power, your glory, your anointing. You get that? Your shadow can fall on sick people and they can get up and walk. That's not something for Bible times. That's something to believe for for right now. Amen. If you have faith as of the grain of a mustard seed, you can speak to a mountain. Say, be thou removed and it will cast itself into the sea. That's something that is available now. If all of that is true, and we use Jeremiah as an example, we use David as an example. I didn't have time. If I had time, I'd show you a man who was born blind. And Jesus said the reason the man was born blind is that God would be glorified through him. Because the disciples want to know this man was born blind. Was it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? It's in John 9. Jesus said neither this man's sin nor the sin of his parents, but that the glory of God should be revealed in him. So whether you're Jeremiah, who was born to be hated by prophesying Israel's destruction, or whether you're David, who was born to be king and had to fight all kind of devils to get there. Or whether you're a man who was born blind because God was looking to shine through less than ideal circumstances. Wherever you may be and whatever you may be going through, it is all written in the book. Just keep turning pages. Now watch this. This is very interesting. To me anyway. hope it is to you. I believe we don't operate in our purpose because a human free will is a fact. And sin is a fact. And religion in the spirit of condemnation taught us that the plan was more fragile than it actually is. Swallow that. Religion in the spirit of condemnation taught us that the plan is more fragile than it is. When God ordained for David to induce the line that would produce the Messiah, did he know he would have failure? Let me ask you this question. No, these people get nervous when we start going down this road. When God told Peter, your name shall be called Petra upon this rock, I'll build my church, the gates of hell, not prevail against it, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Did he know at that point that he would cuss him around the campfire and deny him three times? Of course he did. But God did not say, if you never make a mistake, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. My God, I believe one of the reasons why we're shouting in here is because we know how much we did that should have messed up the plan, but God in his infinite grace and mercy is still letting us participate. The plan is not over. Come on. Come on, I know you've been through some stuff, but the plan is still intact. I know people wrote you off, but the plan is still intact. I know you've been frustrated and wounded, but the plan is still intact. Stand up on your feet. Let's embrace this last thought together. So many have come to me over the years. Chris, I get this all the time. Brother, I want you to pray with me. See, people, for some reason, think that if you have a prophetic ministry, you're a palm reader, and I don't even think that's biblical. Prophets in the Bible were not walking around with tape recorders giving people personal prophetic words. They were speaking to a nation. And people come up to me all the time, Pastor Ronnie, and this is what they say. I don't know what God has called me to do. And I'm going to say this, now don't get mad at me. We made it this far. 
I don't believe you. I don't believe that you don't know what God called you to do. I believe the spirit of condemnation will not let you believe you still get to participate in the greatness of what God has called you to do. Come on, Habu. Quit running around believing because you made a mistake that you somehow derailed the plan. Your God, it, listen, if your mistake can stop God's divine purpose, your God is about that big. Amen? God's not looking for perfect scorecards. God's looking for pursuing hearts who say, yes, I've made mistakes. I hate. I hate this with all my might. God hates divorce. Anybody agree with that? I hate divorce. I've seen what it does to people. I have a phenomenal marriage. But nothing makes me matter than people who think God can't use them now because religion told them they're disqualified because they went through a divorce back here. Because whatever you did or didn't do that caused your divorce, we thought about it. I know I ain't getting no amens on that. I forgot I was at a Baptist church where everybody pretends like they had never had a bad thought, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna help you anyway. I said I'm gonna help you anyway. If a man looks at a woman Hey, Talabosa, see, think about this. You're not disqualified. The plan is still intact. The plan is not as susceptible to being derailed as you think it is. Get up. Believe God again. I see so many people walking around under the spirit of condemnation that says, I can't be used by God because of my past. What kind of glory does God get? When God shines through somebody that should have been dead, but God used them anyway and shined through their less than ideal past. I don't believe you don't know what God's called you to do. I believe deep inside you do know what God's called you to do. You just won't let yourself believe you deserve to participate in the plan. And this is not humility. This is a frontal insult to the blood of Jesus and his power to cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. So many will not release their faith concerning their promise because they believe they've waited too long like Caleb. They believe they've committed too many sins like Paul. Why does God use a Christian murderer to write two-thirds of the New Testament? Just in case you believe what you did was too bad. He murdered Christians. That's not good, Paul. <laughs> I want to say this. And I'll say this very aggressively. There, there'll never be a day that I'll get accused, I don't guess, of preaching greasy grace. I've, I've preached too hard on sin for too many years and I'll keep doing it. But I want to tell you this. I want you to hear me clearly. Oh, hallelujah. There are consequences to sin. I'm sorry, but as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. There are consequences to your sin. Ask David. Amen. Listen, ask Paul, in case you want to be real new covenant dimensional. Ask Paul where there are consequences. Yeah, I'm going to show you the things that you're going to have to suffer for me. There are consequences to your behavior, yes. But don't let the consequence of your behavior be the last page in the book. Keep turning the page until you get into the fullness of the dimension that God has designed for you and I. I know people who think they can't be used by God because they don't understand the Bible well enough. The guys in the New Testament didn't have a Bible. Paul didn't birth the church at Ephesus because he was an expert on the book of Ephesians. Y'all got to think about this stuff. Look, they birthed the New Testament without the New Testament. See how in our carnal subculture we always glorify intellect? Listen, I don't care if you're 14 and were raised in foster homes and have been abused. You can heal people right now. 
My God, you don't have to wait till you get out of Bible college. Most of the people coming out of Bible college can't heal anybody. So you need to start believing God could use you right now to be a part of something. You ain't got to go to seminary to preach. Go to Walmart. Find somebody that doesn't know Jesus and bootleg an ordination from the Holy Ghost and preach like you lost your mind. Hallelujah. You don't need stamp of approval. You don't need a bunch of nonsense of a bunch of people running around celebrating you. You need to realize I am here because God so loved me that he preserved me for this day. I want to I close with this thought. Thank God that the standard for fulfilling our pre-designed intention is not perfection. It's grace. What are you not doing for God today because of what you've been through in your past? What are you not doing for God today because religion keeps telling you you have to have a perfect scorecard? What are you not doing for God today because you've lived through less than ideal circumstances? Of all of the names they could have called out when they needed Yeshua to heal them in the Bible. They said, son of David. Because David may have had some nasty pages, but that's not all that was written in his book. Come on, friend. You may have had some nasty pages, but that's not all that's written in your book. It's time for people to begin to let the glory of God shine through them regardless of all the things that condemnation is trying to whisper in your ear. You can have a tremendous impact in the earth right now. And I want to pray for people today. I want to pray for people that are operating under this spirit of condemnation. And I want to break that thing off of you. And I want you to start believing that you can do for God what you've been called to do for God just like you never made a mistake. How much glory does God get? When somebody in the New Testament says to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And, and the devils start looking at each other. Demons start looking at each other saying, Listen, I thought y'all told us y'all had him. Yeah, but he kept turning the page. David's story could have ended in tragedy, but he never quit turning the page. Paul's story could have ended in tragedy, but he never quit turning the page. I say there's a grace in here today to turn the page. I say from Almighty God, there's a grace and there's a mercy that's available for you to turn the page. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, or maybe... You're within the sound of my voice this morning and there was a time in your life you once served God but you've turned away from serving Him and you are not serving Him now the way you once did. Turn the page. You're going to be miserable on that page. We've all been on that page. There's nothing but misery and heartache and pain and disappointment on the page that separates you from God. Turn the page where the love affair begins. Turn the page where God breathes his breath into your life and you get joy unspeakable and full of glory. Turn to the page where you get peace that surpasses all understanding. Turn the page, friend. There's good things God has in store for you. Just a moment, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, but I'm going to ask you to be very respectful and for nobody to dismiss themselves during this time. This is the most important time in the whole of the worship service. This